Welcome back. I think if you're like me, we had a great day today. So I would like to thank you and all the organizing committee for bringing us here. I think it's an absolutely fantastic place. And uh, it was so really stimulating to chat with all of you. So I realized yesterday uh, when I arrived and saw all the talks that we guys have a very different point of view on sea urchins. I think I love them. I think they are just great. And I, I really like studying them. And most of you, you hate them. You want to kill them, right? You want to get rid of them. So I think we have a very different point of view on this. And uh, so maybe at some time I will be a little bit excited about how cool they are. But anyway, so this is the menu of today, right? So it will be searching on the menu, of course. Uh, so we will start with some, uh, with, with some discussion about ocean acidification. So who knows what ocean acidification is? Raise your hand. One, OK, so I, it's good that I have a general introduction. Uh, so I, I will try after that to give you kind of a state of the art or where the, where the research is today. Then uh, a general, my, my talk is supposed to be about sea urchin larvae, but I will try to make it a little bit more general and give you some information about urchins in general. And then sea urchin larvae, that will be the main course. Uh, I hope it will, won't be a little bit too tough. I think, let me know if, it's, if I go too much, too much into details because it's really hardcore physiology. Uh, and I can be really excited about these things. So what I want to show you is why sea urchin respond in the way they respond. So we will talk about energy budget, the role of environmental variability, the modulating role of evolution, and carryover effects. And also try to, to take this into a multi-stressor perspective. And then conclusion, and I will show you if we have time, a little game that we have developed to, for, for kids to understand these kind of issues. OK, so let's start with a high CO2 world. So as you know, since the beginning of the Industrial Revolution, we are changing the world uh, globally. So it's the first time that we as a species are doing something like that. We are changing the whole world. And uh, we are changing many things. We have global changes that include global warming, ocean acidification, hypoxia in some region, increased precipitation. We had discussion about that yesterday more catastrophic events that can also have consequences for dispersion of pathogen, for example. And then this is on the top of everything else that we are doing to the environment, including habitat destruction. We overexploit the resources, local pollution, and so on. So it's not good news. We are changing a lot the ocean. And, uh, and one of the things we are doing is releasing all this CO2. And you probably know that curve, so the Keating curve, showing that since the beginning of the Industrial Revolution, we have this really high increase in CO2 in the atmosphere. And I really like that graph in particular because you can see that we are doing this. Because every time you have something happening in human history, that has an impact on CO2 emission. You have a war, we decrease CO2 emission. You have a financial crisis, decrease in CO2 emission. So two message here. We are doing this, and if we really want to, we can change it. So if you check here the values that will tell you that we are at that moment, for the moment, releasing 8.8 .8 petagram of carbon per year. So who knows what a petagram is? <laughs> I have no idea, right? So <laughs> the thing is that it's good to understand how big this is. And a petagram, if you check on Wikipedia, that's a petagram, right? Or that's a petagram, or it's one billion ton of CO2. So this is crazy number. And I stole this metaphor to a guy called Chris Sabine. So basically, if you take a wagon full of coal like this, this is made 80% of carbon. That represents 80 ton of carbon, right? So the, the game now is how long would be the emission train if we transform this 8.8 .8 petagram into number of cars here? How long would that be? Somebody wants to play? <laughs> like one kilometer, 100, 1,000, 1 million? OK, if you do the math, <laughs> it's like 8.8 .8 is 110 million cars like this. Or if you put them all after the other, it's 44 times around the Earth. So that's what we are releasing as a species into the atmosphere every year. And what we also know is that the, the ocean is absorbing a big part of this, like one fourth of the CO2 is ending into the ocean. And that's great for us because that's minimizing the effect of global warming. Uh, but on the other hand, that has a consequence, that is ocean acidification. And if you turn that into the car metaphor again, that means that every second of every day, one of these car and into the ocean. And the consequence is ocean acidification, because it's very simple to understand. If you put CO2 into water, it, it turns into carbonic acid. 
you have more proton into the water, so the pH drops, and you have increasing acidity. And that's something that is already happening. We know that the pH, the average pH in the ocean decreased by 0.1 pH unit, so it's a 30% increase in acidity. And we expect, and that's kind of optimistic scenario, that by the end of this century, the pH will drop by 0.4 pH unit. And that's a doubling in acidity because pH is the logarithmic scale. And you can see on that graph, so this is the average oceanic surface pH, that this never happened in the last 20 million years. So that's a huge change happening very, very fast. And that means that species were not adapted or did not evolve for this kind of stress. So it's a dramatic stress. So where are we today in the ocean acidification research? It's quite a new field. I think it's like 10 years old, so a lot of things to be done, but the community is huge now. A few weeks ago, we had a high CO2 world meeting in Monterey, and we were like 500. And like four years ago, we were only 200. So you can do the maths. It's really increasing uh, research. And the question, the question we all want to answer is easy. What will be the consequences of this changing for ocean, ecosystem, species, and their services? And when, when we started investigating this, so as I said, like 10 years ago, we thought it would be simple. Like the hypothesis behind all that was all the marine calcifiers will be negatively impacted because under low, lower pH, it's more difficult to build shells. That was kind of the idea, and they dissolve more easily. And we had some evidence of that. So if you check this, this is coccolithophores, that's some marine phytoplankton, and you had evidence that they had problem building normal shells under low pH. And this is corals. You have also really nice evidence that they are heavily impacted, but you also have evidence for urchins and, and other groups like crustaceans and, and bivalves. However, this idea came from the chemist. Okay, and believe it or not, but animals are not pieces of calcium carbonate. They are very smart in buffering environmental changes. And the pH where they build this, their shell is not the pH in the water, right? So they can change that, and we will see that with search in larvae. And we could have, as biologists, told them that actually that's completely wrong. If you check in some many areas in the world, you will see that calcifiers can live in really extreme pH condition. One example, if you go on the sea or on deep sea vents, the pH can be extremely low, like five, right? So it's like extreme pH. And what do you have there? Bivalves everywhere, big bivalves that size. If you go on upwelling area, like here, that's in the Kiel Fjord, uh, in the Baltic, again, pH extremely low, like 2,000 ppm, so it's two times more than what we expect in the average ocean. What do you have there? Muscles everywhere. So if they are adapted to it, they can survive really low pH, right? Keep that in mind. So just to show you how the field evolved over the years, so when we started, we thought, yeah, it's easy, all calcifier will be negatively impacted. Then we realized that, well, maybe it's more complicated. And just a way to show you that many people are working on this, and we are investigating a range of different species. And yeah, just to show you, I will skip that. Uh, so just this is a summary of what was known more or less a year ago. So that's all the species that were investigated. And I use this simple color code, like blue, no effect, red, negative effect on fitness, and green, positive effect. And if you summarize, you can see that it's more or less half-half, and all these are calcifier, or most of them. And even within group like echinoderms, you also had like a really mixed response. So it was really species-specific. So the next $1 million question was, how can we explain this variability? And then over the year, like you had a really series of really cool paper with proof of concept and showing that actually there are many things that were not taken into account. Acclimation, carryover effects, synergy with other stressors, adaptation, and so on. So the good thing is that now we know what we don't know, okay? So we can move forward, and that's where the field is today. Like, people know that they have to work at the ecosystem level, they have to take into account long-term exposure, including different life history stages, and so on. So it's, a, it's not an easy task, but we are on the right path. And just to tell you that oceanification is a really important issue for, for the environment, but also for the socioeconomic point of view, and one of the main achievements of the field recently was, actually, it was mentioned in The Simpsons. So it's in the pop culture now. And in the US, everybody knows about ocean acidification now. So that's good, because there are a lot of pressure on politicians, and we can really try to work on solutions. And there are some solutions. OK, sea urchins now. 
So as I said, I promised to talk about sea urchin larvae, but uh, Jose Carlos asked me to write this chapter for, for the book, and what, doing that, I thought it was kind of silly to just focus on larvae, so I, I kind of reviewed again the literature on everything. I just want to show you a couple of graphs on this, and then we will go back to the larvae. But yeah, that's the thing. So just an overview of the literature. So you have 48 papers today uh, focusing on sea urchin and ocean acidification. And when you summarize also like crudely all the results, this is what you have. So one third of the studies show no effect or positive effect when the other ones show either a negative effect and that's kind of negative effect but sublittle, like delay in development, this kind of stuff. And I just made this map to show you where the studies were done. So you have kind of hotspots in research. Europe is one. You have the, the west coast of the US and you have Australia. But what I wanted to show you that is that there's a lot of things to be done. Nothing is known on South America. Nothing is known on Africa. And very more or less nothing is known on Asia. So there's a lot of things that we need to do. So that's kind of take home message. And this is just to show you that the amount of information we get is increasing exponentially. So there's more and more people, and that's just showing the cumulative number of publication. It's increasing really fast, and that's really exciting because we learn more and more. And among those, we have like kind of three superstars. Like these three sea urchins are the most studied, and that's where we actually start to have a good idea about what could happen in the future. What's something that is also very important, and we, we had mentioned of that before, is that you have to take into account the whole life cycle. So sea urchins often release gametes into the seawater. You have fertilization, production of a larvae, plankton uh, feeding or not, and then they settle, and you have a lot of different morphological changes going through and maturation to the adults again, so you need to close the loop. And I just like trying again to summarize in a, in a visual way the different impacts. And what you can see is that basically the adults, they do quite okay. They are much better at buffering than we thought, and so they, they are doing okay. Fertilization, it seems to be quite okay too. Um, and the more sensitive stages are the larvae, and the juvenile. And we can see that the juvenile are probably the more sensitive in all the life cycles. So if you want to work on this, I highly recommend that you focus on the juvenile stage. And if you can work on the whole life cycle, that's even better, as I'll show you later. So far, there's only one species where you have information on all the different life history stages, and that's Echinometra. OK, not dead yet. We can start the hardcore stuff now. Uh, so that's sea urchin larvae now. So that's where mo most of the studies were done on sea urchin larvae for obvious reasons. It's used as an ecotox model. A lot of information is available. You have the genome. All the gene regulatory network was, were described. So it's an easy model to, to work with. And that's an example, really beautiful little thing. So what's happening when you put these guys into seawater in that are mimicking what could happen in 100 years? So pH decrease of 0.4. And that's something really consistent in the literature. What's happening, they grow slower, right? They survive OK. They don't really die more. But what's happening is they grow slower. So that's an example for one species. But that's the same for most of them. This is the control. This is time, the size. And this is low pH. So basically, it takes them a couple of extra days to reach settlement. And that's just a visual representation of that. So you have no control. You can see beautiful rudiment. When in low pH, they are a little bit delayed. They're going to reach that stage, but it takes a couple of extra days to do it, meaning that they're going to be indirect impact on their survival, because the more time you spend in the plankton, the more you die by predation. But that's very little informative, isn't it? The question is, why are they growing slower? And is there kind of a limit of what they can cope with? So that's why we wanted to understand the mechanism behind that. And working on a thing that is one-tenth of a millimeter and do physiology is not an easy task. And that's what we spend a lot of time is trying to develop new techniques to understand it. So just the concept, right? So it's just like a car, OK? A, a species is just like a car. It's about energy that you have, gas, and what you can do with it. So this is today. Oops. Oh, my cool animation. Uh, so this is today. So you, you can do a certain kind of performance with a certain amount of, of gas. And this is the future. So basically, by putting them into more acidic water, you make things a little bit more difficult, right? So it's just like if you have to drive on the mountain here compared to the flat Belgium. Uh, so what would happen then is because it's more difficult, you will have different performance, right? So that's what we see with the sea urchins. 
they grow a little bit slower, just because you have to, to, have to do the best you can with the energy you have. So to dissect the energy budget, you need to know the energy they get and what they do with it. So to know what they do with it, you, you can measure respiration. So we, made, we developed a method to measure respiration using micro outputs. And this is time, uh, and this is respiration rate. And what you can see that the control, that slow pH, they double their respiration rate when they are exposed to this ocean acidification. And that means that they have an extra cost, okay? So they need more energy for something. And the question will be, what are they using this energy for? Second part is feeding. Are they eating the same? Are they eating more? Are they eating less? So to do that, that's that graph. And basically, they seem to eat the same stuff. And we measure that using one of these classic methods they use with coffee pots. You take a bottle, you put some food, you put some larvae, you wait 12 hours, you check how much food remains, and that tells you a little bit the feeding rate. So we were kind of, I think, confident with this data, but the problem is that you have to put many larvae in the bottle, and we wanted to have the information at the individual levels to be sure that they were eating the same. And again, not easy to measure feeding rate on something that small. So what we did is we developed this new technique using confocal microscopy. So we, we fixed the larvae on a small micropipette and put them under mi a confocal microscope. So confocal microscope is just like a normal microscope, but using lasers. So that allows you to basically keep it on the focal plane. And you can see two things in color here. The red stuff will be chlorophyll. So that's the food, that's the phytoplankton. And the green stuff is digested chlorophyll. So you see how it works. So you film them, you put them there, and then you, you film. And you can basically see that with the ciliate, they will attract the food into the mouth. Then it will enter into the esophagus here, and then you have a contraction, and the food enters into the stomach. Wow. And you can see digestion in action, basically. So using that, you can calculate how many cells they eat, how fast they digest, and a lot of different parameters. So it's, it's extremely time consuming, but Mike Stumpf, one of my postdocs, she spent a lot of time doing this, and basically this is how it works. Every time they eat, you have increase of fluorescence into the stomach, and you can measure the rate of digestion. And again, we observe more or less the same stuff. So pH, ocean acidification, is not impacting the feeding, and we check also uh, the, the enzyme activity inside the stomach, and that doesn't change anything. So they eat the same. So if we stop here, they don't have more energy or less. They have the same amount of energy, but they have extra costs that we could see through this respiration. So if you try to summarize that using energy budget model, this is how it looks like. This is time. So when they grow, they take more and more energy. They feed more. They feed more. And then the blue and the red stuff, it's the, the energy they use for growth or they use for maintenance. So basically, this is the part for maintenance, so just survive and keep the tissue right. And this is the leftover energy is used for growth. And you can see that when you expose them to low pH, what's happening is that you have less, the portion of energy left for growth is decreasing, okay? But the question is, again, what are, you, what, why, what are they using this energy for? And to do that, I wanted to have an estimate of how much energy they use to build the skeleton. And that's a really tricky question, of course. How can you isolate the portion of the energy budget used for, for, for building the skeleton? And then I found this really cool paper. So what they did is that they took urchin larvae and they dropped them into pH 5, so super acidic, for two hours. And then whoosh, you have this. Basically, it's washing the skeleton away, but the larvae is still alive. So this is the cool stuff. So you can transfer it back into normal water and, oops, they rebuild their skeleton in a few days. So I thought, like, this is great. This is the technique I need, because then I can calculate how much energy they need to rebuild the skeleton. And that will give me a rough idea if it's 1%, 10%, or 50% of their budget. OK? So yeah, that this is the embarrassing part of my talk, you will see. So it was Friday, <laughs> OK? And uh, Friday afternoon, I had nothing to do. Like, oh, and I decided, OK, I'm going to try this technique. I had nice uh, brittle star larvae. Seven days, I say, okay, I follow the protocol, drop them into pH 5.8, and wait two hours. Two hours later, I check nothing. They were still swimming around, beautiful skeleton. I say, oh, come on. So I wait one more hour, nothing. Two more hours, nothing. And I say, like, okay, whatever, it's Friday, five o'clock, I go to the pub, okay? <laughs> so I, I say, I'll come back after the pub. So I go to the pub, have a couple of beers, and then come back to the station to check on my larvae, and then 
just by chance, a big party around. So it was the end of a course, and I said, oh, I can get a couple of extra beer, right? And then I went there and completely forgot about my experiment. <laughs> Saturday morning, completely hangover, and say, okay, whatever. I think my, my, they would probably be dead. I repeat that on Monday. And I check on Monday, three days later, and believe it or not, they were still alive, okay? So the larvae looked like crap, like this. You can see they retract. They looked actually like a larvae of a three-day, but they were still alive. And some of them still had pieces of skeletons. So I was like, wow, that's really amazing. So the, the message behind that is that they are much, much better at buffering pH changes than I thought. And just to tell you, it's good to drink beer because that, thanks to that, I ended in nature, <laughs> okay? So I, I told this story to a journalist of nature and basically he started this, this paper with this really embarrassing stuff. The Friday night BS made Sam Dupont forget all about this sea urchin. So, you know, fame comes in very strange ways. <laughs> anyway, I'm not only a drinking scientist with sloppy and so on. I repeated that in a better way with Strangulus and Trotus Perperatus. So what I did is took like seven days sea urchin larvae, so you can see how they grow in controlled condition. Then I decalcified them, so I realized that I needed at least 12 hours to wash the skeleton away. And then this is what's happening. One day you can start already some pieces of skeleton appears. After like seven days, they are back more or less to normal, just that this part is not regenerated and it doesn't matter because they lose it anyway. So in seven, a little bit more than seven days, they are back on track. They are normal larvae again. So that's truly amazing, I think. And then I did a lot of measurement, like swimming, feeding, uh, gene expression. So, but the more important part is this, it's respiration. So that's respiration rate. And the blue stuff is respiration of the normal larvae, not decalcified. And the red one is a decalcified larvae. So this is in, during the process of recalcification. So here they are back on normal and this is completely decalcified. So the blue part is the difference between the two and that's the extra energy they needed to rebuild their skeleton. And if you measure it, it's around 10% extra. Okay, so they need 10% extra energy to rebuild the full skeleton. So what this tells you is that just grow a normal skeleton will be much less than 10%. So the portion of the energy budget they need to calcify is quite small. And if you do the same experiment into using low pH water, so kind of ocean acidification scenarios, the cost is 22%, okay? So it's doubling the cost of building the skeleton. So that tells us that probably it costs twice the amount of energy to build a normal skeleton into ocean acidification uh, experiments that we did before. So probably a part of this extra cost that we've seen before is linked to calcification, but is it used directly for calcification or indirectly? So that was the next step. Okay, you're not dead yet. <laughs> okay, so that was the question. Like, this is the, the energy they use for calcification in normal process, and you have the extra part. So what are they using this for? And we had the feeling that it's not calcification. It's, it's indirectly through pH regulation. And if you check in the literature, you will see everywhere that larvae, pH, I mean, sea urchin or in general invertebrate larvae are not able to regulate the internal pH, and this is wrong. And we can show you that now. I can skip this. So what we did is that we had to develop new techniques to measure the pH inside the larvae. So remember, this is a few hundred microns, really small stuff. So we had two approaches. One to, was to design microelectrodes that just go inside the larvae and measure the pH. And the other one was using dyes that are pH sensitive. And that allows you, for example, here to measure the pH inside the cells. So we combine the two approach and we end it with this, um, this model. So that's the urchin larvae, this is the skeleton. And you know that around the skeleton, they have special cells called PMCs, right? And that's where they calcify. And what we, we've shown is that if you change, if you decrease the pH outside the larvae, it's changing inside the larvae immediately. So they are totally unable to buffer the pH in their extracellular fluid. The, the, the epithelium is very leaky. So it just enter and stay there. There's no control at that level. But if you check inside the cells around the skeleton, they are super good at controlling the pH right there. So very quickly, the pH goes back to their normal value. So they are very good at buffering the energy there. And there are two different processes to do that. It's playing on the carbonate chemistry and using proton pumps and proton pumps got a lot, cost a lot of energy. So they have proton pumps that just send the, 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 the proton out of the cell, okay? And if you block these proton pumps, basically they are totally unable to build their skeleton. So 
So that's where the energy goes. Okay? So in control condition, you have some energy for growth, some energy for maintenance, some energy for calcification. If you put them into ocean acidification condition, you have an extra cost for pH regulation, meaning that you have less energy available for growth. So that's why they are growing slower. Okay? I'm just drinking. One stuff, yeah. Oh, I would like to, yeah? <laughs> okay, is it clear? So that's kind of the main message. But things are slightly more complicated. I think that's something we discussed yesterday. The pH in natural environment is not constant. It's fluctuating all the time. So the scenario we were testing was this. We were like average pH of today and then some kind of scenario for tomorrow. But if you check in the reality, that looks like this. Fluctuation, daily fluctuation, seasonal fluctuation, and it's, it's much more complicated. So we wanted to know how can we deal with that. So we did more complex experiment with range of pH. And this was our hypothesis. So we were just testing this before. So you have the shift in energy budget. But then more pressure you are putting on them. At some point, you should reach what we call the physiological tipping point, where at the end, they don't have even energy to just grow. And so they should die at that point. So we wanted to push them to their limit. So we tested a range of different pH between 8.1 and 6.5. And we picked 6.5 because that's the pH in the gonads. So at that stage, that's actually the shock in pH when they spawn that induce the beginning of the cell cycle. So nothing should happen at 6.5. And that's what we saw, is that basically you fertilize, you put them at 6.5, they don't even divide. And then the more you increase, the, more, the, more they, the faster they grow. But what we could see is that that's a different parameter we checked. I think it's just to make it very quick, but we checked growth, survival, development, symmetry. And we could identify clearly some kind of tipping points where if you're upper, than this, they grow a little bit slower, but they don't die more. This, they are still OK. Uh, they still have a normal development. And just to illustrate that, this is how they look if you are on that side. So again, they will grow a little bit slower, but they look perfectly fine. And this is how they look on the other side. So they are completely abnormal. They die. They are symmetric, and so on. So you have a clear tipping point here between normal and abnormal. And what is really fascinating is that this tipping point is also the limit of the natural pH variability of today. So this is the kind of extreme pH that they can have from time to time in the fjord in Sweden where they live. And the interesting part is that before that, we were just testing this and this, right? And we were kind of missing the fact that in the future ocean, this natural range will shift, OK? So they will spend some time oops, in, in that area where they will be unhappy. So now, to try to understand really what would be the consequence of that, we work with modelers that have really crazy models where they can predict pH, temperature, sanity, variability today and in the future with a resolution of 20 minutes. So that we, will, we are using this that we plot into the model and test different kind of time resolution and see the consequences for the larvae. That will be for next time. Um, well, how long do I have? I don't know. Yeah? Sure? Cool. It's going to be quick now, anyway. So other stuff also important to take into account. One is evolution. Not, of course, not every organism reacts in the same way. If I put Jose Carlos on me in the fridge for two hours, I probably cope better because I live in Sweden. Uh, but, but that's kind of the idea, right? We all have different genotypes and different ability to cope with stress. And so to test that, we compare different population and made like classic breeding design, you know, that we used to do in the old days. And that's probably one of the best way to do this kind of stuff anyway. So we, we use different females, different males, cross them, make different families, and expose them to different pH, and then follow them till settlement. And just trying to see if they, how they were reacting. And uh, as predicted, you know, just to show you like, how it looked like. So never do an experiment like this. It's crazy. So we had 64 culture running at the same time, bottles everywhere. And I don't know if you worked with that, but controlling pH in, in a flask is not easy. And it's a lot of work to, to, to do this kind of stuff. So that's how it looked like. So that's Micah, uh, the postdoc in the lab, Nariman, PhD student. Uh, yeah, sometimes I just wanted, that's why I had less, I had less hair now than I used to. But I think I'm Belgian, so you know how to make me happy. Uh, OK, anyway, so we checked a lot of different parameters on this experiment because we invited a lot of people to join. So we checked gene expression, we checked all the, the physiological parameter, feeding, respiration, and so on. I think I won't have a lot of time to, to go into details, but if you're interested, we can chat about this later. 
But the, the take home message is the, was again that not every family is reacted in the same ways. Some here were even reacting positively to ocean acidification. They're growing better at low pH and surviving better when some here were reacting in a negative way. So they were growing slower. And what, what is kind of a fascinating observation is that you have a relationship between how badly they were impacted and how fast they were growing because all the families were also growing at different, a different speed and that's related to their mat to maternal effect and genotypes. So basically the faster you grow, the more you're impacted. So that would suggest that in the future ocean you may have selection for smaller eggs because smaller eggs will give smaller larvae that will grow uh, a little bit slower. And that's exactly against what is kind of the selection pressure that we have today because we want bigger eggs because you spend less time in the plankton. And then some, the cool thing about this kind of research is that it's full of surprises. We still are not really sure what we are looking for sometime. And, and, so, and during one of these experiments, one of, uh, of my visitor, Karen Chan from the University of Washington, came and said, like, come, I think we have something really weird. And all the larvae looked like this. So basically, they were budding and synchronously. So we had that, we repeated that several times. And all the time, we had this kind of strange events for one day where all the larvae were producing, I mean, at least 50% of the larvae were producing a bud. So sea urchin larvae, I don't know if you know that, but they are able to reproduce kind of asexually. So sometimes they just produce this kind of blastula-like structure that can develop into a new larvae. So it was shown in, in different species. And that's something that seems to happen in, in, when they are exposed to ocean acidification. So we interpret that as either an attempt because they are stressed to, to produce more larvae, like division, or a way to reduce their size. Because if they reduce their size, if you remember, they will grow slower. So they might be less impacted. OK, so another important stuff to take into account is carryover effects. So carryover is like not investigating one single life history stage at a time, but transition between the different life history stages. So if you have this, uh, what we did is it pre-exposed the adults for four months. After four months spawn, culture the larvae into different pH. So we made like a crossing, some that were in 8.1 and did in 7.7, .7, some that were in 7.7 .7 in 8.1 and all the crossing, okay? And after settlement, we made another split, right? And, uh, and what we saw is that that's just one example, that the survival of the juvenile after three months is that if you compare the direct impact of ocean acidification on the juveniles, so from larvae that were raised in controlled condition, there were no impact. They were just fine. But if both the larvae and the juvenile were kept into low pH condition, you had this really strong increase in mortality. And basically, if you exposed the adults, the larvae, and the juvenile, you have a 100 time increase in mortality. And we interpret that as by the fact that you have cost at every stage, and at some point they don't have energy left, and they just crash. So that's just to show that just investigate one stage at a time doesn't tell you much. You have really to take into account the whole life cycle. And then, as I mentioned in my very first slide, ocean acidification is not happening alone. It's happening in synergy with temperature change, a lot of different parameters. So that's also important to take that into account. And if we focus on larvae, the environment they will be spawned in the future are depending on one simple parameter, what triggers the spawning. And that's different between species. It can be temperature, it can be light, it can be presence of the phytoplankton in the water. And depending on this, some larvae will spawn in warmer water, some will spawn in water with less food. So that's the first thing you have to consider if you want to study this in what condition my larvae will live in the future. So let's assume, just for the fun, that they're going to spawn in warmer water, right? So that could happen, for example, if, temperature, if uh, I don't know, a temperature independent of spawning could occur. So we, we did this experiment, and it's just to illustrate that if you want to make some kind of prediction, it's really good to understand the mechanism. So that's time, that's growth, and that's if you have your control condition, okay? So if you increase the temperature, what's happening? They grow faster. That's not rocket science, it's well known. If you increase the metabolism, they are able to eat more food because the viscosity of the water decreases. So they grow faster. They have more, more energy, increased metabolism, they can grow faster. If you decrease the pH, you have this. 
So in that case, we talked a lot about this. They can't take more energy. They have extra costs, so they have less energy left for, for growth. So how can we predict what would be the, the impact of both? Because we understand really well the physiology, we can make a model. Okay? We know on what parameter of the energy budget they impact. So we made this, this simple model and made prediction, and this is what we predicted that could happen if you combine the two stressors. So that's basically based on mechanistic understanding of the physiology, and this is what we observed, so we were really pleased. Uh, so actually, the thing is that every population is experiencing different conditions, so you can't test all the species in the world in all the locally relevant conditions. So if you understand the mechanism that allows you to make prediction without having to test every species in the world in every locally relevant conditions. So that's what we are doing. We are trying to understand the mechanism better and better. So I hope that you're convinced that you have to do some physiology. Okay, so conclusion. So gametes and adults of sea urchin are quite okay in, in when you expose them to ocean acidification. They don't really die. They are really able to buffer. I didn't have the time to talk about this. But they are really good at this. Uh, larvae and juvenile, in particular, juveniles are more sensitive. Uh, there is, for larvae, a delay in development. And this is due to a cost, uh, energetical cost, to control the pH inside the cells. Evolution can definitely modulate the response. Carryover effects are extremely important. You also have to consider multiple stressors, as I just mentioned. And you can expect some surprises, which is kind of the coolest part. Uh, just before we finish, so two more slides. Uh, and, and that's because it's really important to communicate this kind of stuff. We need to educate the public about ocean acidification. And the community of ocean acidification is extremely active in the field of communication and education. And we have a, a group in Christineberg developing some tools to basically to be used in the classrooms. So, so we, we develop some tools that we implement in the classroom, and so the, the kids can understand what ocean acidification is. And this is one example. So that's what we call the search in virtual lab. So basically, we allow kids to do this kind of experiment in, in, in the classroom, because it's really difficult to do that in real. So I just show you a short movie to show you how it works. So the first part is just like games like this to understand simple concept, like what is pH. So they have to put like different product that they know on the pH scale. So it's just a drag and drop game. And then they have some basic information on the chemistry, what is pH, what is carbonates, and so on. And then they have the coolest part is the lab. So they have a bench. And they have to do search in culture. So they have flask that you have here. And then they have a pH meter. They have a microscope. So what they have to do is make uh, water a different pH, make some, some flask with different X. They can take some, check on a slide, put a cover, of course, right? <laughs> you put under the microscope. And then you can take pictures and check with normal or polarized light. And then they have, after a few days, measure some larvae. OK, and I think it's simple. They have only to take three larvae. <laughs> but uh, so at least they can they understand the concept of replicates, that it's important. And then at the end, they can do very nice statistics and show in a graph what's happening. And uh, basically, what is really cool is that if you're 10 students in a classroom doing this, they will all have different results. We want them to understand that science is not about truth, right? It's about you just have a snapshot in it. So the game is that they have the results if they had the whole data set, but this is what they see. And so they just compare the different students what they have in the classroom and then we can discuss about scientific process and so on. And after that, we have another game that I won't tell you about, but where basically they learn about what this means, because, okay, search in larvae are a little bit smaller, whatever, right? But we put that in a bigger con context, like how important it is for the whole ecosystem, for the other species and so on, and then it ends with the, so what? What can I do about it? And that's the third game, and the third game is a carbon uh, footprint calculator designed for students where they can see what every single step in their everyday life has, a, what is the impact of this every step on their carbon footprint. And they can see what they can change. Like, what is it, does it really matter if I unplug my computer every day? Does it really matter if I stop eating meat? And so they can actually change their way of life. And it's a really cool and efficient system. So that was quite a success. And if you want some access uh, to this, it, it's, uh, it's so free. It's on internet and it's translated now. It's in English, in French, uh, in Chinese for some part. It was made by Greenpeace. Uh, German, Portuguese, and Spanish will be re soon ready. So we are working on the Spanish part, so you, you can use that. So I, ca I, can, I think I can give you the link and you can maybe distribute if somebody is interested. So to end, like the, 
different person working on this, so it's a collective effort. So we have Mike Thorndike that some of you probably know, he's the, the, the head of the, of the lab. Uh, Olga, who, who uh, is the, just had a baby now, so it's the second baby of the lab this year. Uh, so she's the molecular biologist. Bengt, he's our animal dealer, so he's really good at uh, finding whatever species you know. He used to be a fisherman, so he knows all the little tricks to, to find them. Michael and Marianne are the two postdocs this year. So Michael did all the nice uh, intracellular pH measurement. Uh, this is uh, Nariman, the, the PhD. So she did uh, the range of pH experiment. And this beautiful lady is my wife. She's doing all the uh, education work. So she's the one developing all these cool toys that I just show you. And this person were involved in some of the aspects. There are some, some visitors. So thank you so much. And I hope you're not dead. And taking credit, take questions. <laughs>